experimentation. And so in this particular session, uh, we have speakers Lee Gold, Lucas Kwong, and Robert Leston, who isn't here because of jury duty, so I'll read his paper uh, at, the, at the last part of the session. Um, and just so everybody knows, if you haven't been to an academic uh, symposium or conference before, I'll introduce each of the speakers uh, in turn and let them read their paper. Uh, and we're going to hold all the questions until the very end of the session, uh, where we'll have a question and answer period of like 15 minutes. Okay? Uh, that way, everybody has a chance to share their ideas before we then uh, you'll begin asking uh, for more detail or maybe challenge what their uh, arguments are. So uh, to start things off, uh, we have uh, Lee Gold, uh, one of the organizers of the uh, symposium as well. Uh, Lee Derek Gold received her doctorate in German literature uh, in 2011 from New York University. She teaches Introduction to Poetry in English 1121 at New York City College of Technology and Ancient Literature and Composition at Borough of Manhattan Community College. Her current research interests include science fiction's role in the classroom, research on Ursula K. Le Guin, and connections between dance, literature, and philosophy. Uh, so, go. Thank you so much, um, and I'm very excited to be here. So I'm just going to be very low tech and read my paper. If you can't hear me, please let me know, and I can certainly project more. <coughs> Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, or the Modern Prometheus, is a revolutionary novel for many reasons, which we contemplate in honor of the text's 200th anniversary. Considered one of the first scientific science fiction texts among other genre connections, Shelley wrote a work that is tied to the experience of mourning. Many discuss how the novel is a novel of mourning. Both Victor Frankenstein and Mary Shelley must confront the loss of their mothers. Shelley's subsequent loss of her husband and children mark her work. Scientific invention is tied to mourning in the novel and mourning drives experimentation. Like Shelley's incorporation of loss and mourning, there are many science fiction works that probe the relationship between scientific inquiry and the human being's response to loss or death. I'm especially interested in Ursula K. Le Guin as a writer who traces the links between loss and science and considers mourning throughout her writings. Le Guin has stated that how we mourn should be understood as part of how we relate to the world. Both Le Guin and Shelley also are writers whose works epitomize interdisciplinarity and often resist simple classification. In one of the most important theoretical texts on mourning, Freud's Mourning and Melancholia, Freud distinguishes between normal mourning and quote unquote pathological or abnormal mourning, what he describes as mourning that does not end. Mourning instead in which the individual is not able to let go of or release the mourned object. It is this pathological mourning that shares features with melancholia or depression. The depressed subject and the one who cannot overcome mourning experience the same symptoms. Freud also focuses his attention on the enigma of suicide. Victor Frankenstein is often read as one who never fully mourns the loss of his mother, and it is mourning that compels his scientific pursuits. It is after the death of his mother that Victor begins his studies that ultimately lead to his reanimation of the dead that result in a being whose existence both stems from and results in loss. A subject is created whose very identity revolves around mourning. And here we can see why much scholarship explores the connections between the monster in the novel and Mary Shelley herself, whose mother's death also impacted her identity. Frankenstein's monster, rejected by his creator and society, one who seeks a companion or love, turns to reading to understand himself and existence. The monster reads a famous text on mourning and suicide, The Sorrows of Young Werther by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, first published in 1774. Another link in their literary chain, Le Guin, too, discusses her love of Goethe's poetry. For her, he is one of the most significant of poets. The nameless monster describes what he learns from reading Werther. Yeah, I thought Vanta himself a more divine being, quote, sorry. I thought Vanta himself a more divine being than I had ever beheld or imagined. His character contained no pretension, but it sunk deep. The disquisitions upon death and suicide were calculated to fill me with wonder. 
I did not pretend to enter into the merits of the case, yet I inclined toward the opinions of the hero, whose extinction I wept without precisely understanding it. I found myself similar, yet at the same time strangely unlike to the beings concerning whom I read and to whose conversation I was a listener. The path of my departure was free, and there was none to lament my annihilation. My person was hideous, and my stature gigantic. What did this mean? Who was I? Whence did I come? What was my destination? These questions continually recurred, but I was unable to solve them." End quote. Though the demon, one of the terms that is used in the novel to refer to the name, nameless creation, cannot fully comprehend Werther, he identifies with him. Through Werther's story, the monster reflects upon his own subjectivity, his own self, turning to the perhaps most painful question of his own origin and lack of connections or attachments, his identity as one shunned by his own parent or inventor. The sorrows of young Werther begins with the call to receive the protagonist as a friend. In the preface to the novella, we read, quote, let this little book be thy friend, if owing to misfortune or through thine own fault, thou canst not find a dearer companion, end quote. The monster indeed is a reader without companionship and identifies with the mourner. He calls himself a wretch, despises himself, as does Werther, whose story, also an epistolary one like Shelley's novel, begins with a turn towards loss. Werther's narrative written in his letters emerges from his loss of his first love. Werther's suicide, his taking himself as his own object, in turn causes a feeling of wonder in the monster. Suicide resists full understanding, yet the monster describes Werther as divine, the monster who too suicides at the end of the novel. Victor Frankenstein begins his scientific pursuits directly following his mother's death. His quest for scientific knowledge is not only tied to the loss of his mother, but Frankenstein represents a scientist who perhaps goes too far, who disregards ethical practices, the link to the figure of Prometheus made clear. In the beginning of his studies, upon absorbing his professor's lecture, we read, quote, so much has been done, exclaimed the solo Frankenstein, more, far more will I achieve treading in the steps already marked, I will pioneer a new way, explore unknown powers, and unfold to the world the deepest mysteries of creation." End quote. Mystery famously compels many scientific discoveries, research, and experimentation. Einstein, a physicist incorporated in Ursula K. Le Guin's short story, Schrodinger's Cat, insists that the unknown or mysterious must be embraced. From the mysterious, he argues, comes any true art and science. Frankenstein connects mystery to power. His drive is thus connected to his desire for mastery. Even at the end of his life, Frankenstein, after confronting the abysses of loss and destruction, famously declares to Walton, quote, seek happiness and tranquility and avoid ambition, even if it be only the apparently innocent one of distinguishing yourself in science and discoveries. Yet why do I say this? I have myself been blasted in these hopes yet another may succeed." End quote. The ethical lessons that one might learn, the devastation caused by the scientific impulse here are overshadowed by the desire to continue the pursuit of knowledge. Arguably, it is in part due to his status as perpetual mourner that Frankenstein cannot disconnect from the ultimate goal of finding the secrets to animating the dead. In many ways, Le Guin's short story, Schrodinger's Cat, published in 1982, can be read as an answer to Frankenstein's inability to understand the ethical implications of scientific research. Shelley's novel of warning is taken up by Le Guin in a text named after science. The short story, Schrodinger's Cat, turns to a famous experiment which involves the imagining of a dead cat, one of Le Guin's favorite animals. It is also a text concerned with how we mourn. The text is named after the famous thought or Gedanken experiment by the Austrian physicist Erwin, Erwin Schrodinger. Thought experiments or Gedanken experiments are used to describe creating in the realms of science and science fiction alike. Le Guin refers to her own text as thought experiments throughout her work. Schrodinger's thought experiment was the physicist's way to respond to what he thought was incorrect in the 1930s field of quantum mechanics. The Copenhagen School of Physicists theorized that a subatomic particle could exist in two states at the same time, the concept of superposition. They then claimed 
that only when the particles are observed, ostensibly by the human being or scientist, do the particles end up being in one state or position only. Recently, discoveries have been, been made, I just read this by chance, um, that seem to support, and other science people can really clarify maybe, um, recently discoveries have been made that seem to support superposition in research on green sulfur bacteria. Though still on the micro level, the theories to which Schrodinger's thought experiment responded continue to be investigated. Schrodinger, influenced and encouraged by his colleague Albert Einstein, used his 1935 thought experiment to show that superposition is not possible when we start to think about everyday observ observable objects. An object cannot exist in two states at once. The original thought experiment after which Le Guin's text is named is described as follows in Schrodinger's essay from 1935. Quote, One can even set up quite ridiculous cases. A cat is penned up in a steel chamber along with the following device which must be secured against direct interference by the cat. In a Geiger counter, there is a tiny bit of radioactive substance, so small that perhaps in the course of the hour, one of the atoms decays, but also with equal probability, perhaps none. If it happens, the counter tube discharges and through a relay, releases a hammer which shatters a small flask of hydrocyanic acid. If one has left this entire system to itself for an hour, one would say that the cat still lives, if meanwhile no atom has decayed. This experiment is meant to exist in imagination only. The imaginary scenario is used to suggest that we cannot have a cat that is both dead and alive at the same time. This suggests that theories of quantum mechanics can't work when applied to larger objects such as cats. In Le Guin's text, the nameless narrator is confronted with whether or not he or she will be willing to, con to actually conduct Schrodinger's experiment with a cat the nameless, sorry, and genderless narrative. The cat who is part of the narrative is in fact identified as Schrodinger's own cat by a speaking dog who wants to try to mimic the original experiment, though the dog's version of the experiment gets some details wrong when he attempts to explain the experiment to the narrator. The dog also insists that what he needs to see through the experiment is certainty. Le Guin suggesting that the desire for certainty may be another human or even scientific pitfall. Le Guin's inclusion of animals is central throughout many of her works. She writes that in order for human beings to relate better to the world, they must see their kinship with animals and the natural world, rather than simply objectifying both. Her rewriting of Schrodinger's thought experiment repairs the objectification of the animal. The narrator in Schrodinger's cat also attempts to understand mourning. The narrative begins with the narrator stating that he or she has moved to a different space or place one that is described as a space which is, quote, cooler and nothing moves fast. The text begins, therefore, with the image of loss. The narrator has left where he or she had lived. Le Guin's narrator confronts the experience of this loss, quote, so I came on, placing one foot carefully in front of the other and grieving. The grief is with me still. I fear it is part of me, like foot or loin or eye, or maybe even be myself. For I seem to have no other self, nothing further, nothing that lies outside the borders of grief. Yet I don't know what I grieve for, my wife, my husband, my children, or myself. I can't remember. Most dreams are forgotten, try as one will to remember. Yet later music strikes the note, and the harmonic rings along the mandolin strings of the mind, and we find tears in our eyes. Some note keeps playing that makes me want to cry, but what for, I am not certain. The yellow cat who may have belonged to the couple that broke up was dreaming. All this cat can say is meow, but maybe in his silences, he will suggest to me what it is that I have lost, what I am grieving for. I have a feeling that he knows. That's why he came here. Cats look out for number one. The narrator shares a vision of mourning that connotes a lack of understanding. Grief's ideology is unclear. The narrator cannot pinpoint the origin of his or her pain. As Freud explains in Mourning and Melancholia, both melancholia and the mourning that does not come to an end at a certain point can often emerge from an unknown loss or be unconscious. One does not always know what one mourns. In Le Guin's text, grief becomes part of the self. There seems to be no subjectivity without loss. The body itself is bound up with grief, yet the cause of this grief remains uncertain. The mind receives sounds in the narrative, music elicits grief. 
Here the mind is described as already wired to absorb music, Le Guin pointing to her many discussions of the inextricable link between music and writing as the origins of poetry remind us. It is furthermore the cat, the body or being, who in the scenario of Schrodinger's experiment, as well as other scientific experiments, would be objectified or treated as object of scientific research, who instead becomes, symbolizes deep knowledge. The cat offers possible guidance to the narrator, might help the narrator understand something about mourning and loss. Le Guin's writing about her own cat card in her blog comes to mind, as well as her children's book, Cat News. The cat is also described as cool in the narrative. The narrator states that it is, quote, pleasant to pet his fur after a description of a hot and fast paced world that had to be abandoned for the cooler ones. Jacques Derrida's writings on mourning help us think about mourning as not necessarily having clear beginnings or endings. Instead, the work or process of mourning is understood as even unlocatable. Mourning does not simply follow a linear, fixed process, and instead is ever present. Even our friendships, he explains, are grounded in the possibility of losing the other. Mourning is tied to a lack of understanding or even to enigma. Freud's foundational text, Mourning and Melancholia, is even marked by the absence of certainty or knowing. He repeatedly states that he cannot be certain about his own investigation and ends his text with the suggestion that he will have to wait until more can be known about his own topic of inquiry. Le Guin's text, Schrodinger's Cat, echoes this focus on enigma. Indeed, her entire short narrative is grounded in the enigmatic. The one who pushes to follow the call of science in Schrodinger's Cat is a dog. The nature of identity is complex as the animal becomes scientist and experimenter. After the narrator has been interacting with the cat who is described as a graceful yellow tom with long whiskers and yellow eyes, a dog appears in the narrative, quote, while I was opening a can of sardines, a person arrived. Hearing the knock, I thought it might be the mailman. I miss mail very much, so I hurried to the dog and said, is it the mail? A voice replied, yeah. I opened the door. He came in, almost pushing me aside in his haste. He dumped down an enormous knapsack he had been carrying, straightened up, massaged his shoulders, and said, wow, how did you get here? He stared at me and repeated, how? At this, my thoughts concerning human and animal speech recurred to me, and I decided that this was probably not a man, but a small dog. Large dogs seldom go ya, wow, how, unless it is appropriate to do so, end quote. In most of her readers' conception of, conceptions of what is quote unquote real, we might expect that dogs do not talk, and even if they did, they might not be discussing scientific experiments. Further, usually we can decipher whether someone is a dog or a human being. The end of Le Guin's short story closes with mystery and awe. The cat willingly jumps into the box in the narrative even after first marking it as its own. After this, with the, bo with the box of the dog, whom the narrator names Rover, wanted to use to try to copy Schrodinger's thought experiment, now with the cat inside, the experiment transforms into a space of non-knowledge or incomprehension. Quote, I went to the box and with a rather dramatic gesture flung the lid back. Rover staggered up from his knees, gasping to look. The cat was, of course, not there. Rover neither barked, nor fainted, nor cursed, nor wept. He really took it very well. Where is the cat, he asked at last. Where is the box? Here. Where is here? Here is now. We used to think so, I said, but really we should use larger boxes. He gazed about him in mute bewilderment and did not flinch even when the roof of the house was lifted off just like the lid of a box, letting in the unconscionable, inordinate light of the stars. He had time just to breathe, oh wow, end quote. Okay. Le Guin has written that science fiction as genre should not be used to predict the future, but insists that it describes reality. In the preface to her last collection of poetry, she writes that science can describe objects or the natural world, but it is poetry that can get at the essence of all beings. Here we are given a reality that is defined by the mysterious, but perhaps we grasp, grasp something about the essence of experience, and specifically, the experience of creativity. There is the opening into a space of expansiveness and possibility. Space and time are no longer fixed or containable, echoing the field of physics and her text's title. Le Guin's interest in Taoism, she has translated the Tao Te Ching, 
is palpable here. The Tao Te Ching and the second central text in Taoism, the Zhuangzi, describe not knowing as essential to understanding. What we cannot grasp is lauded as path to understanding. Limitless understanding and knowledge can happen through, paradoxically, non-understanding. We as readers are left in a state of wonder and awe, the dogs wow and act in our own experience as we are transported by Le Guin's imagery. The text closes not only with this mystery, but also with the turn to loss and melancholia through the reference to the composer Robert Schumann. Le Guin inserts the figure of Schumann, one of the most important classical music composers, quote, I have identified the note that keeps sounding. I checked it on the mandolin before the glue melted. It is the note A, the one that drove the composer Schumann mad. It is a beautiful, clear tone, much clearer now that the stars are visible. I shall miss the cat. I wonder if he found what it was we lost. Okay, up next uh, is uh, Lucas Kwong. Lucas Kwong is an assistant professor of English at New York City College of Technology, where he has recently served as coordinator for the Literary Arts Festival writing competitions. His scholarship includes the article Dracula's Apologetics of Progress, published in a 2016 issue of Victorian Literature and Culture, as well as a forthcoming article on H.P. Lovecraft's The Call of Cthulhu for Journal of Narrative Theory. His current research project examines how late Victorian fantastic fiction reimagined the era's uh, fascination with religious difference. He also serves as the assistant editor of New American Notes Online and City Tech Writer, a journal of student writing. Victor Frankenstein is a would-be scientific luminary, but in his quest to create life, he's also a would-be deity. In the Doctor's tortured relationship with his creation, Mary Shelley inaugurated science fiction's perennial fascination with religion. Eighty years later, H.G. Wells' The Island of Dr. Moreau would take up his fascination by reimagining a discipline, the science of religion, that braided anthropology, evolutionary biology, and philology. This morning, I'd like to examine how Moreau participates in debates germane to this hybrid discipline. Through sojourning to an island of half-human, half-animal worshippers, Wells suspends his scientist narrator between suspicion and sympathy for the unreal religion he discovers, observes, and eventually inhabits. Before examining the way that Wells holds a mirror to the science of religion, though, we might pause to take stock of what exactly this novel is reflecting. By the time Wells wrote Moreau in 1895, the science of religion had come a long way from its origins as an 18th century offshoot of philosophy and theology. It had become a branch of science devoted to studying the origins of religion, the extent to which it evolved under universal laws, and whether it would remain a permanent future of society. Some key figures include Max Muller, a philologist who argued that mythology's origins lay in linguistic corruption, uh, Edward Tyler, who argued that religion began as an attempt to account for the content of dreams as well as the distinction between the dead and the living. And uh, Andrew Lang, who posited the existence of an X region of human personality, the source of what he called miracle prophecy and vision from which, quote, the great religious innovators and teachers, end quote, had drawn their power. Two axes of debate emerged within this interdisciplinary science of religion, both relevant to our examination of Moreau this morning. One is the question, what is the objective basis for studying religion? For Mueller, it's linguistic analysis. For Tyler, it's the laws of, of evolution, which govern religious development no less than biological development. For Lang, it's scientific study of the X region. The question of objective criteria becomes complicated by the fact that by the end of the century, the system that circulates knowledge of indigenous religious practices has become extremely convoluted, or perhaps it was already convoluted, but it's just becoming apparent that this is the case. Uh, by 1892, Max Miller is complaining about the unreliability of available sources about indigenous religious practices since they emerged from a welter of quote, sailors, traders, missionaries. 
input, as well as imperial scholars who copy up these accounts uncritically. Mueller calls for a new epoch in the study of uncivilized races, those are his words, dependent on eyewitnesses free of racial or religious prejudice. Thus, when James Fraser's landmark work, The Golden Bough, came out in 1890, he's sure to proclaim reliance on a, quote, wide-ranging network of local experts in the colonies. The end of the century thus sees a recognition of the need for credible eyewitnesses instead of the kind of abstract theorizing or hearsay uh, you see in earlier scholars of the field. Muller's cringeworthy reference to the, quote, uncivilized races ironically juxtaposed with his condemnation of racial prejudice, leads us to the second axis of debate, which is, how does the science of religion feel about its object? In Leishman's phrasing, the discipline divides into what we might call sympathetic and suspicious camps. The sympathetic view was represented by American scholar Thomas Higginson, who in his 1872 address, The Sympathy of Religions, likens the scholar of religion to a sailor navigating a sea brimming with the cargo of international exchange. Just as the sailor immerses himself in a global web of commercial shipping, in Schmidt's words, uh, the scholar of religion must traverse Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism to arrive at what Higginson calls the piety of the world. On the other hand, suspicion involved treating science of the science of religion as a study of priestcraft, the study of theological chicanery and oppression. Uh, what's notable is that neither the sympathetic camp nor the skeptical camp were immune from racist attitudes toward those they studied. Mueller thought that the uncivilized races were worthy of sympathy, but he still sees them as objects of liberal condescension. On the other hand, we have people like James Hunt, uh, the president of the British Anthropological Society in the 1860s, whose strident atheism was premised on hostility toward the biblical notion that all races had a common origin. For Hunt, a fully scientific study of religion would embrace the fashionable theory of multiple origins and therefore multiple levels of humanity. Scholars like Hunt disdained religion precisely insofar as it seemed to be the exclusive province of the lower races. It's easy to assume that the island of Dr. Moreau falls closer to the position of a Hunt than of a Higginson, given that Wells called the novel an exercise in youthful blasphemy, and also that his mentor was Thomas Henry Huxley, a pro-evolution biologist who called himself Darwin's bulldog. <laughs> and indeed, just to consider the premise of the book, Edward Prendick, an Englishman trained in the, scientists, in the sciences, washes up on an island populated by half-animal creatures who worship the titular doctor as a god. Earlier in the novel, Prindick's description of beast religion delivers a surreal vision of the eyewitness record that Max Miller champions. Prindick observes, quote, three grotesque human figures, naked of a dull pinkish drab color, such as I had seen in no savages before. I never saw such bestial-looking creatures. All three began slowly to circle round, raising and stamping their feet and waving their arms. A kind of tune crept into the rhythmic recitation, and a refrain, Alula or Balula, it sounded like. Suddenly, as I watched their grotesque and unaccountable gestures, I perceived clearly that each of these creatures, despite its human form, had woven into it the unmistakable mark of the beast. At this early stage, neither Prendick nor the reader really know what's happening on the island. We know that Moreau has been performing experiments on the island, but exactly what these experiments are remain mysterious. Are these supernatural creatures? Is Prendick hallucinating? The term Mark of the Beast also evokes revelation and the satanic figure prophesied uh, to rule humanity. Moreover, the creatures seem to be involved in a kind of demonic parody of Christianity. However, Prendick's response isn't that of a scandalized Christian or a sympathetic scholar. You can imagine that if Prendick were more of a pious character, his narration would play up the presence of seemingly supernatural evil. Instead, his narration makes clear that he's experiencing the situation as a skeptical scholar. His attention to the creature's physical appearance is that of a Victorian biologist studying a new specimen, while his recording of the ritual is a version of the kind of anthropological analysis you might find in James Fraser or in Edward B. Tyler. Moreover, even in his fear, Prendick hypothesizes and infers from data in real time. 
A couple chapters later, we find Prendick forced to participate in a ceremony where the creatures recite a kind of litany praising the law as well as a mysterious hymn. His is the house of pain. His is the hand that makes. His is the hand that wounds. His is the hand that heals. Even in his bewilderment, Prendick is making connections, surmising that, quote, Moreau, after animalizing his men, had infected their dwarf brains with a kind of deification of himself. In other words, he hypothesizes that Moreau has programmed the beast people to worship him. It even seems possible that Moreau is running an experiment designed to replicate the natural origins of religion. The scene and its implications thus present a dream or nightmare come true for the science of religion. Uh, and Prendick's response is that of a quintessential skeptic. Instead of being frightened by the ritual or entranced by it, he reports that, quote, superficially, the contagion of these brutes was upon me, but deep down within me, the laughter and disgust struggled together. So this isn't exactly a vision of uh, the piety of the world. With his mixture of fastidious observation and racialized contempt for the bestial, brutal worshippers, Prendick does James Hunt proud. And yet if we look closer, we can also see that Prendick isn't quite the hard-nosed skeptic he appears to be. While recounting the ritual, Prendick comments, I could have imagined I was already dead. And in another world, he also says, I could have fancied I it was a dream, but never before have I heard chanting in a dream. <coughs> in these moments, Prendick floats some pretty unscientific readings of his situation. Perhaps he's dead, and this is the afterlife. Perhaps he's asleep, and this is a dream. In flirting with such fantastical hypotheses, Prendick hints that he may in fact resemble these crudely religious creatures more than he might like. Shortening the distance between scientific observer and devout observee, these moments foreshadow a pivotal scene later in the novel where Prendick confronts Moreau and learns the truth about his experiment. Moreau reveals that the creatures on the island aren't humans who have been refashioned into animals as Prendick suspected. Instead, they are animals carved and wrought into new shapes, Moreau's words. Not only that, but Moreau hasn't taught them to worship him. They develop their religion on their own, loosely based on the teachings of a Kanaka missionary who accompanied Moreau on the island. Kanaka here denotes a Pacific Islander. So in other words, this is not an English missionary, but rather a colonial subject who has himself converted. All of a sudden, we have a more complicated story that resists interpretation as an allegory for religion's essential fraudulence. Uh, if Moreau's creatures were humans who'd been turned into animals, and if Moreau had taught them to worship him, then perhaps we'd have a straightforward parable about how religion functions as a tool of oppression. But instead, they've sort of come up with their own religious system on their own, as a check on their animal side. And Moreau, in fact, feels disgusted by it. He sees it as a mockery of rational life, a laughable attempt at civilization. In other words, the beast religion does not signal savagery, but rather an aspiration to transcend it. After all, a key phrase in the beast's ritual is the repeated question, are we not men? In calling the beast religion a mockery of rational life, Moreau seems to concede that religion, like science, is fundamentally an act of reason. The gap between Moreau and his creatures collapses further when we learn that Moreau considers himself a religious man. Indeed, the point of Moreau's experiments is to eradicate pain itself, which he frames as an act of devotion. He says to Prendick, I am a religious man, as every sane man must be, and maybe I fancy that I have seen more of the ways of this world's maker than you. For I have sought his laws in my way all my life. I tell you, pleasure and pain have nothing to do with heaven and hell. This store which men and women set of pleasure and pain is the mark of the beast upon them. So here, Moreau unwittingly reworks Prendick's earlier description of the beast people. The mark of the beast retains its biblical resonance, but here it no longer signifies an external appearance, that which is subject to empirical observation. Instead, the mark of the beast is an internal state, a fixation with avoiding pain, that actually links them to us. In his determination to destroy this fixation, Moreau practices his own kind of religion, stamping out humanity's bestial impulses so that they can become more godlike. Just like the beast's sacred law, 
Moreau's own experiments are a means of getting closer to his creator. With this scene, then, Wells rejects the impulse to surveil uh, superstition from the majestic heights of skeptical objectivity. Revealing that the beastmen perpetuate the law of their own accord, he suggests that religion is the inevitable biological destiny of all rational uh, beings, and therefore not a phenomenon that humanity could easily outgrow. Furthermore, he intimates that scientific inquiry itself harbors an inevitably religious undercurrent. Like Frank Victor Frankenstein, Moreau wants to play God, but unlike Victor Frankenstein, he sees his experiments as a service to God, an avenue to a higher spiritual life. In this rewrite of Shelley's novel, both the man scientist and his creation are driven by profound religiosity. One can thus read the novel as well as illustration of the dynamic uh, described by cultural historian J.W. Burrow, who wrote of 19th century European science, that the more the scientific view of the world seems to replace religion, the more of its predecessors metaphysical and emotional and even ethical responsibilities it seems to have to assume. To further blur the lines between rational inquiry and religious awe, Wells forces Prendick to actually become part of the religion he finds so revolting. <coughs> uh, when Moreau dies, the beasts discover his body and wonder whether his death means the end of the law and the house of pain. The house of pain is a vivisection chamber where uh, Moreau performs surgery on any beasts who are in danger of reverting back to uh, animal instinct. Prendick surmises that if the beasts start to believe there isn't a law anymore, uh, they'll give in to their beast impulses. Thus, assuming the role of a prophet, he radically reinterprets their religion. He tells them, children of the law, he is not dead. He has changed his shape, he has changed his body. For a time, you will not see him. He is there, I pointed upward, where he can watch you. You cannot see him, but he can see you. Fear the law. Prendick posits a messianic eschatology here, proclaiming that the master and the house of pain will come again. This sparks an animated discussion in the course of which I had really convinced several of the beast folk of the truth of my assertions. Swapping disciplines for a moment, Prendick trades in his scientific credentials to play a doctor of divinity. Call it beast folk seminary. But what's really happening underneath this impression of Thomas Aquinas? Does, does Prendick really retain his racialized contempt for the beast folk and the religion? Well, certainly, uh, he continues to keep a scientist's fastidious eye on his surroundings, charting the degeneration of the beast folk's civility. It's as if, even as Prendick struggles to survive, he knows that attending to the beast behavior could result in a landmark scientific text, i.e. the very text that we are reading. However, at this point in the novel, he's also lost the affective disposition he displayed at the beginning of the novel, the laughter and disgust mingled together that characterized his initial reaction uh, to the beast religion. Instead, Prendick develops what he calls a friendly tolerance for the beast's creatures. In particular, uh, the monkey man develops a habit of repeating everything Prendick says, calling his utterances, quote, big fix. Uh, and of the monkey man, Prendick notes that he had developed, in the most wonderful way, the distinctive silliness of man. Once Prendick escapes and returns to London, this friendly tolerance for the beast folks' ways becomes an inability to escape them. He's unable to shake the feeling that the men and women I met were not also another beast people, reporting turning aside into some chapel. And even there, it seemed that the preacher gibbered big things, even as the ape man had done. We could read this as a takedown of Christianity. Ha ha, the preacher is just like the beasts. But it also works as an ironic sign that Prendick has picked up the beast's habit of mind. Paradoxically here, he has a revelation of religion's beastliness that itself approaches the all-consuming intensity of religious vision. Indeed, his chapel anecdote echoes part of the end of Nathaniel Hawthorne's short story, Young Goodman Brown, a church scene where Goodman Brown has an epiphany that his minister is secretly a moral monster. Uh, Michael Sherborne, in his biography of G. Wells, reports that Wells was reading Hawthorne at the end of the 1880s, and it's entirely possible that Wells here offers a fleeting nod to Goodman Brown's religious vision of 
religion's fraudulence. If Prendick thereby demonstrates sympathy with a religious mindset, though, it isn't a patronizing racial condescension, a kind of heartwarming affirmation that even savages have faith. Instead, sympathy here involves a disturbing suspension between two radically different models of reality. This is, of course, a hallmark of fantastic real, uh, literature. As theorist Svetin Todorov puts it, it's the hesitation experienced by a person who knows only the laws of nature confronting an apparently supernatural event. Torn between the assurances of reason and the whisperings of magical thinking, Prendick perceives that religion everywhere functions as an attempt to make sense of a frightening and incomprehensible universe, be it in a church service or in the monkey man's sermons. Indeed, as we've seen from Moreau's philosophy, such religiosity underpins the scientific vocation itself. In the novel's closing lines, Prendick finds peace in affirming science's sacred connotation, seeking salvation in astronomy. Thus, Prendick says, there is, though I do not know how there is or why there is, a sense of infinite peace and protection in the glittering hosts of heaven. There it must be, I think, in the vast and eternal laws of matter, that whatever is more than animal within us must find its solace and its hope. This allusion to the law complicates Wells' description of the novel as youthful blasphemy. It suggests that some measure of deliberate sympathy with the beasts, with their devotion to an unswerving set of principles, may be the best way to avoid their fate. However, in embracing science as religion, Prendick also avoids Moreau's zealotry. The epistemological humility of the phrase, I do not know, precludes the absolutism behind Moreau's menagerie of horrors. By extension, it rebukes the absolutism of both the sympathetic and suspicious camps of the science of religion. Neither naively assuming that all religions believe the same thing, nor painting them all as antagonists to the skeptical hero scientists, find support in Prendick's I do not know. Prendick's final psychological state also rebukes those in our era who insist on the separation of science and the sacred. The new atheists who abhor religion and the anti-evolution Christian ideologues who abhor scientific inquiry have this in common. Neither very much likes the notion of science and religion mutually interpreting one another in a process of reciprocal illumination. It's this visceral fear of intellectual and spiritual contamination that Prendick works through over the course of his time with the beast folk. If there is a positive outcome to Dr. Moreau's experiment, <coughs> It's Prendick's final embrace of the possibility that science and religion remain permanently, hopelessly intertwined. For those today who resist that insight, a trip to Moreau's Island may be just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> So our next speaker uh, is Robert Leston, uh, who uh, I mentioned before is a jury duty, so he can't be with us today. Uh, but I'll read his paper and play a um, <coughs> soundscape that he created for us to listen to after I read his paper. So uh, Robert Leston's presentation is called Between Intervals, A Soundscape for Us Monsters. And... Um, And so we'll go ahead and get started with this. Robert Lesson is from the English department here at City Tech. Uh, and some of his work uh, figures on uh, these aspects of sound and feeling. Uh, so between intervals, a soundscape for us, for all us monsters. The thinking of this project comes from two influences from a recent symposium on sound, rhetoric, and writing. The first is a basic tenet that came from Steve Katz one of the founding explorers of the relationship between rhetoric and music. Katz brought his audience back to question the notion of indeterminate knowledge. Katz posed the following question. How do you leave indeterminate knowledge determinate? How do you investigate an object without ruining the delight of that object? For Katz, one of the difficulties is that we are always in language. And if we want to understand a thing, we may easily go too far by using words to name that thing 
or we may not find words that are capable of expressing that thing, or even if we can express it, it may not be communicated to another, as the meaning that accompanies words often get reinscribed into the vocabulary of the listener. For those familiar, this is similar to the classic soph sophistic triple dilemma or trilemma as the sophist gorgeous of Leotini expressed it just a few millennia ago in 427 BCE. The trilemma is a set of three theses that Gorgias um, forded and that served Gorgias well during his lifetime. Many sophists have reputations for being able to speak eloquently and persuasively on any topic. But Gorgias was known to be able to speak on any topic and then following his oration, turn around and speak even more persuasively on what was known as the disoi logoi, that is, the opposite case. The first part of the trilemma is simply, nothing exists. Those two words, in that order, if you ponder them a while, might give you a headache. And I don't want to give anyone a headache. So I'm not going to get into any of the proofs Gorgias invented for this thesis. I will say that in many ways, his proofs foretell the kind of debates between the rationalists like Leibniz and the empiricists like Hume you heard about in your undergrad philosophy classes. Nothing exists. The second part is, even if something exists, it can't be known. And lastly, even if it could be known, it can't be communicated. It was this trilemma, I think, that Steve Katz was getting at in our symposium on rhetoric and sound to remind us that language is immensely fallible. So when we try to explain indeterminate knowledge, we somehow make it determinate. We name it. We black box it. We nail it down. We make meaning. We communicate. We categorize it. We turn it into something it's not. It's not so much a commonplace to say we're always in language anymore, but even back in the days when we did say it, that didn't mean all that much to a dancer, a painter, or a chef. We may be in it, but we're never limited by it. A gentler language might make us feel our thoughts differently, or maybe we could start speaking with birdsong, crashing waves, and violins. The second influence came from a talk given by Damon Kurakowski, who was working from his book, The New Analog. Kurakowski's talk, for me, resonated with a single message between the essential difference between the analog and the digital. Isn't it great that we don't get the snap, crackle, pop from phonographs anymore? Isn't it great that all that noise is gone? Isn't it great that after 22 minutes, there's no need to get up? walk across the room and flip the record. To borrow terms from cybernetics and electrical engineering, the digital represents pure signal with virtually no noise. Take, for example, the difference between an analog clock and a digital one. The digital tells you exactly what time it is, but the analog clock tells you all the times it is not and asks that you locate the time it is in relation to all these other times. From the viewpoint of the digital designer, the analog communicates information that is not desired, so that information is trimmed away as noise. Noise, then, is information that is being communicated, that is unwanted. Krukowski expanded this basic concept to other comparisons between the analog and the digital. In Google Maps, or Waze, uh, you do not have, you do not have to find your location as the program does this for you. The digital eliminates the whole of the map and locates you into its center. You do not move through the terrain, but rather the mo map moves around you as you move. From this perspective, you have not traveled. Even if you've gone from one continent to another, you are always in the center. Analog technologies, whether they are maps, clocks, or phonographs provide you with a spectrum of noise and leave it up to you to locate the signal or the meaning. When we are purely in the digital, what has been cut out from experience is significant. 
1969, a DJ named Russ Gibb in Dearborn, Michigan, got a phone call from a student at Eastern Michigan University who asked if Paul McCartney had died. The student explained that when you played Revolution 9 from the Beatles' White Album backwards, you'd get the message that Paul was dead. After getting the call, Gibb played the track backwards for the audience. If you've heard this track, you'll know that it's pretty weird playing it forward to begin with. The track was inspired by the technique known as musique concrete, an avant-garde style of sound collage that has many diverse definitions, but in the hands of the Beatles, was really a celebration of noise. The DJ played the album backwards for his radio audience, stirring up the rumors of Paul's death even further. I searched and searched my Spotify interface, and for the life of me, can't find the play in reverse feature. Though luckily, I do have a turntable and the white album. I'll let you try it out for yourself. In both Katz's and Krukowski's talks, I heard them say, quote, you have to look to the noise, end quote. It's not the signal that the thing is being said. In rhetoric, there's an idea that goes back to the sophist called Kairos. To understand Kairos means to understand the ancient way of understanding the Logos. The Logos is all of discourse, and it's not just linguistic discourse. It's also the discourse of the world. The sound of the wind expresses a part of the cosmological Logos. The color of a flower is a part of the world's expression. In this ancient Pythagorean type of way, Kairos means tapping into a moment of the Logos, which is but the tiniest sliver of the continuous cosmological music of the world. It's not what's said, but everything that hasn't been said. It's for this reason that Gorgias could speak on any matter so well, or so he said, because he tuned in to this larger Logos. Chance encounters, chance information, chance people, chance influences from those things you did not expect to encounter. Sometimes I feel like we're tapping into what has historically been the noise and is now becoming the music as underrepresented groups continue to fight and scratch to be heard. But I just saw a story on Boing Boing that a Japanese designer has just created something they call wear space for workers at Panasonic. These are essentially horse blinders that are made for people who work in communal offices to keep them from being distracted. You wrap these devices around your head to eliminate your peripheral vision so your eyes can take in no more than the areas surrounding your computer screen. And of course it depends on what this. Though the use through the use of sound, we are not tapped into pure signal. I would argue that composing with digital sound in academic environments helps sustain two critical objectives. It helps sustain a quality of mystery, uncertainty, and affect in whatever the object of study. Second, in so doing, it opens ourselves to the lost art of listening, and listening especially to those voices that have been historically considered noise. And to this end, there is no better exemplar than Mary Shelley's monster, the embodiment of that thing that should not be. This soundscape is a modest attempt to help us become attuned to the intervals between the signals, the parts of the map we're not traveling in, the times we're not living in, the words we're not saying, to the noise and the monster in all of us. So Robert prepared this soundscape. It's five minutes and 30 seconds long. And so I will begin it playing. And he wants us to listen to it, listen to the changes and the vagaries that he's included in this um, as a way of emphasizing this last point uh, of the monsters uh, and it's all. And then after this, we'll then open it up for a question and answer period.
papers uh, provocative, uh, which for me usually means I see something there that I hadn't thought of before, I like that very much, and then I start making objections. Um, I can't help but say that Mr. Leston should not have gone away because you should judge not lest he be judged. And since he's on jury duty now, I guess it's open season on him here. But um, the comment that I would want to make since I did find them all provocative. Um, got a lot that I would say, but I won't. I must say, Mr. Kwong, um, I believe you give much too much credit to Mr. to Prendick and not enough credit to the implied author. Uh, when Prendick first sees the character we come to know as Maling, he says that he turned with an animal swiftness. The implied author then lets us know that he was made mling from an animal. 
Prendick, from the very first observation that he has of what's going on on Moreau's Island, is untrustworthy. Um, when he goes over to where the beasts live, the text says that Moreau, Montgomery, myself, and Maling walked across the island in exactly that order. He doesn't begin by saying myself, as a rude person would say. He doesn't end the series by saying myself, as a polite person would say. He gives us, in fact, from the implied author's viewpoint, a parody of the great chain of being. Moreau, Montgomery, myself, and Maling. And in that parody of the great chain of being, I think one could argue that the implied author is showing us that religion has been used as a method of social control. It's used as a method of social control in the law that you adduced, but that law is not, in fact, valid. When it says, you know, do not lick up water, are we not men? Sure, men don't do that, typically. But then it says, do not kill, for are we not men? And in fact, men kill all the time. The law is not valid. When Prendick meets Mling, excuse me, meets Montgomery after Montgomery has been wounded, he, realize, he says he wants to kill him. But then Montgomery speaks um, pathetically because he is so wounded. And Prendick says, I had no vessel with which to give him water. But in fact, he did. He had his hands. He could have brought him water, but didn't. His name is Prendick. Um, Prender is the, the name of the, the thing in law that says, you have the right to use somebody else's property, the right of Prender. At the end, when you point, I think very importantly, to at night astronomy, if I recall correctly, in day, it was chemistry. What Prendick has done after his experience on Moreau's Island is absent himself from human beings as much as he can from having any social relations whatsoever. Personally, I see the ending of this not from any other text, but from the end of another story about going to visit islands. It's what we see Gulliver as he reacts to the to horses in the streets of London after he's been changed by his relationships with the Wynnums. I guess what I'm saying is, I think that although and putting things together is Wells's constant effort in most of his great fiction, in this particular regard, I think we don't have any ambiguity. I think there is a continual critique from the level of the implied author of religion as an effort of social control. Whether we make it up as Moreau does to keep the beast people in line, or we just somehow come to it genetically. I think adding the notion that there is a science of religion at the time is excellent. It comes down to us today in work by Daniel Dennett, for example. But I don't think that we should come away thinking that Prendick's view of what's going on is the one that we should accept. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely Prendick is an admirable narrator. And uh, I think certainly that, you know, I don't mean to diminish the satirical element in the book. What I am suggesting is that to simply reduce the representation of religion to uh, a straightforward uh, parable of oppression, I think, um, overlooks the heteroglossic nature of the novel, that the Prendick, yes, is unreliable, and we do see religion function as, uh, you know, perhaps a, a quixotic, or devoted to this quixotic dream of perfect mastery, which ultimately fails, and yet, I think when Prendick absents himself from human society to devote himself to the study of astronomy, there is an unmistakable note of uh, scriptural language in his final paragraph. Now, whether that language is itself an ironic uh, insertion by Wells, I think, is an open question. But I also think um, Wells' critique does not, to me, uh, preclude the fact that religion remains uh, intertwined with science and, and vice versa. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? I have a question for Lee. I'm wondering when you put those, uh, the Schrodinger's cat story, when you started thinking about those two together, how that happened. Um, yeah, I mean, it was sort of coincidental. I mean, I've worked on 
short, I mean, it, I guess I've been working simultaneously on these texts, and I've worked on mourning for my, actually for my doctoral dissertation with other writers in mind. So this is a topic I've been returning to, and I was working on Schrodinger's cat in, in various places, and I, the last time I presented work on Schrodinger's cat, I really felt that I wanted to talk more about mourning because I feel it's so present. Mm -hmm. And especially with Gwyn, who is so much about, so much of her writing and her preface to her recent, her last poetry collection really talks about um, how we relate to the world, this sort of ethical relating that I think people are turning to her work more and more to think about these questions. Um, and so I think I, that once I thought about Frankenstein and okay, right away it just popped to mind because, because I think when I read Frankenstein, the, the last time I read it during my graduate studies, I have to give credit to my doctoral advisor who's written quite a lot on, Avi Talbot now, who's written a lot on um, uh, the text and talked a lot about Werther and mourning in this connection. So I think it's, it's sort of this, almost legacy of writers I'm kind of trying to map out, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. yeah. Other questions, comments? The one thing I, I thought I would ask both the panelists, just uh, um, maybe as a concluding question um, before we take a quick break and move on to our next session, um, what are, you know, and this connects to the theme of the symposium, where did Frankenstein enter into your experiences? Uh, is this something that you had read before uh, and um, you had formed part of your youth before you came, became an academic, or is it something that you encountered much later? And how has it maybe influenced you in some way? I mean, for me, uh, in terms of really reading the text and grappling with it, that happened in grad school. Uh, but I think certainly before that, you know, retrospectively, it's the air you breathe if you're, uh, you know, a fan of speculative fiction or, gosh, I mean, like, you know, if you grew up watching uh, X-Men Saturday morning cartoons, uh, it's there. If you, uh, you know, uh, are a fan of the X-Files, it's there. I mean, um, it's, to me, what makes it such an important text is that it spawned horror and science fiction simultaneously, and that, you know, you see a refusal of, of the strict genre uh, boundaries that, that we take for granted. I was just going to say that I think that's also one of the reasons that I've always been fascinated by the novel, which I also read younger and then returned to in graduate school and sort of saw the multifaceted, almost enigmatic, I and mean, I kept returning to that word. I think so many people talk about this bringing together of, of so many disciplines. And then also in its connection to, of course, science fiction, gothic literature, and then her role as a, a female writer, I think is part of, at least for me and I think others as well, intertwined within all these other genres and within this um, also the monsterized body, the the other, the one who is rejected. So I think the political um, elements of the novel are also part and parcel of the discussion as well. Cool. Any other last comments or questions? Everybody's good? All right, so let's give a round of applause to...